Hello, everyone. How are you? Hi, Kay. Hi, Bonnie. <laughs> Hi, Jeffrey Denton. Thanks for sharing. Hi, Dolores. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being patient while I shared. Okay, so before I get into the National Investment Authority stuff, I want to cover the cabinet stuff uh, fairly quickly. Uh, first, there's a piece on Ram Emanuel. that appeared in Common Dreams okay, a few days back. Title of it was How a Ram Emanuel Appointment Would Hurt Biden and the Democrats. This was done on December 1st. It was written by Richard uh, uh, Escal a progressive writer from way back, and Sean McElwee, the co-founder of Data for Progress, which is a progressive uh, think tank that does a lot of survey work, which has been helping to clarify issues for people. There's a picture of Rom. And the authors make the following points that the inception of a new presidential uh, administration fills the air with trial balloons as job seekers and administration officials test as a reaction of the public to possible appointments. One trial balloon uh, has progressives around the country reaching for balloon popping pins. <laughs> And that is the trial balloon for Rahm Emanuel, Barack Obama's White House chief of staff and the ex-mayor of Chicago. Uh, scuttlebutt about the possibility of appointing Rahm has been circulating now for some time. There was more scuttlebutt uh, last weekend when Axios uh, reported that um, Biden is strongly considering Emmanuel for a Secretary of Transportation. The authors um, here do an analysis showing that an appointment for the notoriously abrasive Emmanuel should be of even more concern to the new administration and the Democratic Party than it is to the left. And the article then goes through research produced by Data for Progress, and in addition, survey data from other sources, places Emmanuel on the wrong side of many critical issues that Democratic voters, and in many cases, the electorate as a whole, care deeply about. According to the authors, it would be deeply divisive and unpopular choice with serious implications for the administration's political and policy future. Of course, Emmanuel is widely known for his harsh language. I remember that very clearly back in uh, 2009. He referred to progressives as um, effing retards, quote unquote, for mounting primaries against conservative Democrats. And that language, of course, insults the base of the Democratic Party, which holds strong progressive uh, views. The authors say we condemn his choice of words. Oh, we don't mean the F-bombs, although the, ab the abuse reflects a politically untenable attitude toward the progressives that make up the party's base. But the ableist language reflects a harmful attitude toward the disability community, an attitude that would later be reflected in his actions as mayor of Chicago. And the review of the author shows that Rahm's record 
stands in sharp, stark contrast to the values and opinions of the American electorate. And they start with the Laquan McDonald case. This involved the murder of a 14-year-old black child by police. That video proved that the police lied about the killing. When forced to choose between a murdered black child and the cop who killed him, Rom directed city attorneys to suppress video evidence. The video was only released after Rom was safely re-elected mayor. He went on to serve his second term. After the release of the video, the police officer began serving a term too, a prison term for second degree murder. Chicago police tactics under Emmanuel were like Trump's and arguably, arguably much worse. Under Emmanuel, Chicago police also operated a secretive so-called a black site, quote unquote, it foreshadowed the Trump administration's tactics against Black uh, Lives Matter demonstrators. As journalist Spencer Ackerman, otherwise known as Attackerman, reported in 2015 practices at a, quote, nondescript warehouse on Chicago's west side allegedly included beatings, shackling for prolonged periods, um, also denying attorneys access to their clients, detaining arrestees without recording them in official databases. Ackerman reports at least one man was found unresponsive in an interview room, quote unquote, there and later died. Emmanuel's uh, the record on policing runs strongly against voter opinion. Our polling shows that 73% of likely voters, including two-thirds of Republicans, 67% okay, of Republicans, believe that the public has a right to know which police officers in the community have records of excessive force, sexual assault, racism, or dishonesty. More than two-thirds of likely voters, including 63% of uh, Republicans, also support allowing people to use public records requests to learn whether police officers in the community have records of excessive force, sexual assault, um, racism, or dishonesty. Emmanuel's record on policing clashes sharply with his, this public consensus on police violence. With respect to public schools, voter support, public schools, and school teachers, February 2020 poll by the National School Board's Action Center found 73% of voters were concerned about inadequate funding and resources for public education, and 64% thought that funding for public schools should be increased. Only 6% thought that their funding should be decreased. His record as mayor of Chicago runs sharply against public opinion. Chicago shuttered 50 schools during his tenure. When Emmanuel closed those schools, the lives of nearly 12,000 school children, most of whom were black or brown, were disrupted. The resulting school deserts deprived urban neighborhoods of public institutions that had been part of the community for generations. Um, um, as mayor, Emmanuel promised affected communities that they would have a voice in determining how the abandoned buildings would be used. But of course, Four years later, two-thirds of the buildings were still vacant. 2017, 28 vacant schools were put on the market for, for sale, despite the public support for public education. Some of the buildings were purchased by private schools. Jesse Sharkey, an official with the Chicago Teachers Union, said to the Chicago Reporter, this move undermines public institutions. Quote, I think it's extremely problematic to close public schools and turn the buildings over to essentially what are competitors to the public school system, unquote, said Sharkey. There were other buildings that uh, stayed in, uh, that uh, stayed empty. Why were the schools that were closed particularly targeted? One Chicago activist um, wrote an op-ed entitled, what led Chicago to shut her down dozens of majority black schools uh, by racism, unquote. 
Uh, Emmanuel said the schools are underperforming, but it, as it, um, the, the author of the article wrote, if they were so terrible, why did people in the black community fight for them? Why do people care so much about schools that the world has deemed to be failing? Unquote. Well, you're getting the picture. Only 34% of Americans say believe the educational playing field K is equal, according to a national poll done by the University of Massachusetts in September 2020. But 81% of black respondents said they see education as unequal. Black voters, of course, are an essential part of the voting bloc, okay, the Democratic Party. Emmanuel's um, education record will not sit well with, uh, with voters. So that's another problem. Corporations, banks, and real estate interests. Rahm has frequently given preference to corporate, financial, and real estate interests. Data for progress research shows voters believe the economic order is rigged against them. A majority of those we polled agreed with statements that included the economic system favors the wealthy and powerful. The wealthy take advantage of workers. People are poor because the economic system is unfair. Business executives use their power to keep uh, the wages low. Rahm Emanuel's record has been closely tied to corporate and financial interests in real estate, backing, banking, and other bulwarks of the current financial system. He's great at raising money from those uh, sectors, but he's not great at doing things for people. Uh, he became a managing director of a Chicago investment bank after he left the Clinton administration. That gig netted him more than $18 million in just two and a half years. The easy way to get rich. That's how he got rich. When he assumed office, he expanded and finalized a pre-existing deal to privatize the city's parking meters. That contract transferred hundreds of millions of dollars in income from the city to private corporations. He privatized. So Rahm claimed the city was stuck with the contract when he took office. That wasn't true. His actions locked the deal in place for more than 70 years. He also claimed he, quote, reformed the parking meter deal. But again, it wasn't true. He expanded it, giving the corporate world even more of a chance to earn back billions on its $1.2 billion investment. Funds that would otherwise have gone to the city and its people. A key characteristic of Rahm's career, his first and foremost claim to fame has been fundraising. He's great at extracting large amounts of money from wealthy and powerful interests. That's money that has shifted okay, the Democratic Party, Party sharply to the right. We don't want it to go there anymore. We want it shifting back, of course. So Rahm is not popular with progressives. Rahm also shut down Chicago's Department of the Env Environment as an austerity measure. The rate of environmental citations issued during his administration fell to less than one third of what it had been during the previous uh, seven years. Public health care, a recent Reuters poll found 64% of Americans are supporting Medicare for all and only about one in four voters opposing, while other polls have resulted in slightly different numbers, usually higher, voters consistently support an expanded role for government in health care. But Rahm himself confessed he begged Obama not to pursue the Affordable Care Act. He just didn't want the public involved, okay, in health care. As for unions, voters support unions. Rahm is not one of those voters. And 
And so during uh, uh, the talks with the unions over the auto bailout, Ram had this to say. Um, um, F, uh, the UAW, unquote, unquote. He was talking about the United Auto Workers. As mayor of Chicago, he unilaterally canceled the negotiated raise for the city's teachers, triggering its first strike in 25 years. He didn't even pick up the phone and call the union president before making his move. The result was Chicago's first teacher strike in a quarter century. When it comes to deficit spending, he's entirely opposed to deficit spending. He's a budget hawk. He's austerity minded. He's exactly the thing we do not need right now. So this is his career. His life and work stand against the values most voters embrace. He must not serve in the new administration. We say that not as members of the left, although we are, but as analysts who see a record that is likely to do serious political harm to the Biden administration. More importantly, the policies he's likely to promote would also do serious harm to the nation itself. <clears throat> so, that is a pretty good account of the record of Rom and why he should never be put into the administration. Then, of course, there's another candidate for the cabinet. This is Biden's possible HHS pick, shielded nursing homes from liability for COVID spreads. Sorry, I should be sharing this with you. This is an article that appeared in Jacobin, and I believe at the Daily Poster as well. Biden's possible HHS pick shielded nursing homes from liability for COVID spreads. So she is being put up for HHS uh, secretary, appears to be favored by Biden. Articles written by Julia Rock K and Andrew Perez, who are two of the people who have signed on with David Sirota at the Daily Poster. And I believe this may have originally appeared in the Daily Poster. Uh, yes, it's mentioned um, at the bottom, telling people they can subscribe to David Sirota's investigative uh, journalism project, hey, the Daily Poster. Uh, anyway, what the authors have to say is that uh, Gina Raimondo, Governor of Cape Rhode Island has presided over one of the deadliest COVID outbreaks in the country. And uh, newly, um, newly obtained uh, documents detail how she helped nursing home uh, the lobbyists Shield healthcare companies from coronavirus related Wall Street uh, lawsuits. Now, Raimondo, a former Wall Street executive, is reportedly being considered for the nation's top healthcare policy job in the Biden administration. Politico reported last week that uh, Raimondo, who made her name slashing state workers' pensions, is one of the finalists to lead HHS under President-elect Joe Biden. She was also previously considered for Treasury Secretary according to the American Prospect. But thankfully, it was Janet Yellen who was nominated for Treasury Secretary, far better than Gina Raimondo. As Governor Raimondo has slammed uh, 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 proposals to expand Medicare to cover everyone. In the middle of the pandemic in August, her administration approved health insurance companies steep premium increases that were criticized by the uh, 
of the Democratic Attorney General of the state as, quote, unnecessary and ill-advised. Health insurance ha insurers have been raking in record profits. With fewer people seeking care because of the pandemic, Raimondo's pushed for Medicaid cuts that nursing home workers warned would result in unsafe staffing levels. And in April, she issued an executive order sought by healthcare industry lobbyists that shielded nursing homes from lawsuits when their business decisions injure or kill people. The order was later expanded to shield nursing homes, hospitals, and other healthcare providers. The Biden administration is uh, considering her. Workers in Rhode Island's nursing homes have faced deadly consequences. Documents show she quickly responded to demands from lobbyists for an executive order granting them legal immunity during the pandemic. And one personal um, injury lawyer said to the Providence Journal uh, last month that uh, the immunity has allowed nursing homes to act unreasonably without accountability. Rhode Island is one of the highest coronavirus uh, death rates by population um, in the country, according to CDC data. More than 70% of COVID-19 deaths in the state have been linked to long-term care facilities. Only two other states have seen similar nursing home death rates, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation. State's hospitals are completely full on Monday, patients were admitted to field hospitals for the first time in Rhode Island during the pandemic. So that's her record um, as a governor. She wanted to reinvent, she had a plan for reinventing Medicaid. And that was a proposal that would result in cuts to Medicaid in each of her proposing budgets for the next five years. At the time, nursing home administrations warned what the cuts would mean for their facilities, staffing cuts. She ignored them. Her plan also involved um, privatizing the management of Medicaid in the state, outsourcing management to private insurers, by 2018, over 60% of the Medicaid budget went to private health insurers. That year, hospital administrators called her round of cuts to Medicaid devastating, quote unquote. Now, the governor's proposed budget for 2020, introduced before the pandemic broke out in the United States, included nearly $60 million uh, in Medicaid cuts for that small state. Amazing. She's an austerian. She does cruel things, okay, in the name, okay, of budgetary responsibility. She's one of the last persons we need uh, but during a uh, um, 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 pandemic. Now, who is the other leading contender for HHS? It is Governor uh, Luhan um, by, um, by, uh, um, by, um, by it is Governor Luhan, um, by, um, by, um, by, um, by, okay, it's Michelle Luhan uh, by Grisham, who's the governor of um, New Mexico, okay, and who is also uh, Hispanic. Now, supposedly, one of the reasons for the consideration, okay, of Gina Raimondo is that she is female. Okay, but the uh, governor Gresham is also female. 
and she is um, his, um, um, Hispanic female. Um, um, also, Governor Raimondo has no experience as the head of HHS at the state level. She has experience in dealing with health care um, as a governor, but she hasn't been responsible herself for an HHS department at the state level. Okay. But Gresham has. Now it's said okay, that Gresham uh, was offered the position of Secretary of the Interior in a Biden administration. And that she told him honestly, she said, I really don't want to become the Secretary of the uh, Interior because my passion, where my heart is, lies okay, in HHS. Uh, that's what I did for New Mexico. Um, prior to becoming the governor okay, of New Mexico. So I have the gubernatorial experience and I have the HHS experience and I'm a woman and I'm a Hispanic. Now, obviously, Gina Raimondo is not a Hispanic, uh, um, um, Hispanic. So from the diversity standpoint, She's not as good a candidate, okay, as Gina Raimondo is. But she's also better than Gina Raimondo. Uh, Raimondo, sorry. Um, in that, she has health and human services experience at the state level. Last I looked, the administrative job of being the governor of the state is more taxing in New Mexico as compared to what uh, to Rhode Island because as small as New Mexico is, um, but Rhode Island is even smaller. So the only thing Raimondo has in comparison to Grisham um, has over her is Raimondo's experience in venture capital. Why is that relevant when you're selecting an HHS secretary? I have no idea why it's relevant or why the Biden administration is favoring uh, Raimondo at this point. But to me, even from their point of view, it doesn't make any sense because Gresham is better from a diversity point of view. She's better from the experience point of view and she's better from the passion point of view. Okay. In other words, her heart is in healthcare and Raimondo's heart just seems to be in the dollars somewhere. So to my mind, there's no comparison between the two candidates. And the Biden administration is way off base here in tending towards a Raimondo appointment. It's got to be the neoliberal influence inside of the, uh, the transition team, which is even giving uh, Raimondo a shot okay, at this. But she has a very poor record for uh, for getting this post she's failed when it came to health to public health care in her state whereas gresham um, um has done well in her position so the choice should definitely be gresham that's the opinion here so let's move now to the National Investment Authority idea. 
Professor, and I'm not sure how to pronounce her first name. It's S-A-U-L-E. Might be Sole or Saule. Or it might be Saul. Uh, Omarova is her last name. So most probably she comes from one of the states that used to be part of the USSR, and that um, is out in the Far East. The first degree was from Moscow State University, by the way, uh, which also suggests that she was born okay, in one of the republics okay, of the USSR. I imagine when the USSR, uh, she came to the United States. I know she got that her uh, she got her graduate uh, school degree here. Now she's a Cornell professor um, in the law school okay, of law, who has a chair. Okay, in the law school, and she's very prominent and has very, very good ideas, evidently. She works with Robert um, Hockett, who we've covered here, and uh, she has been a co-author of, of his and I believe that he supports the idea of a national investment authority as well. The title of this article is Public Investment. Public Investment uh, Reimagined a National Investment Authority. And it was written on December 1st. There's a picture. Um, um, there's a picture of FDR standing up. It was always painful for him to stand up okay, and difficult. He was inspecting the, uh, the Chickamauga Dam near Chattanooga, Tennessee on November 21st, 1938. The dam was built in the late 1930s by the Tennessee Valley Authority, TVA. And there's the title, Big Ideas. This is part of the Big Idea series okay, of the American Prospect. Here's an introduction written by Robert uh, Kuttner, if I'm not mistaken. In the transition to a renewable economy will pay uh, huge. I should be sharing this with you. Sorry. Let me get it back. There we go. But as Keynes uh, famously observed, in the long run, we are all dead the planet and its economy could be facing extinction if we don't come up with very substantial investments in the short and medium term. Of course, I think we all believe that. Cornell professor Saul, uh, 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 Saul Omarova has come up with an ingenious proposal to raise adequate sums inspired by the Roosevelt era Reconstruction Finance Corporation. The idea is to combine a new infusion of public capital with socially benign investment options for workers' capital held in the form of pension funds. Her design, which she explains in the first of several pieces in this uh, the round table, has stimulated both support and respectful skepticism. Would it compete with or complement other long-standing proposals for various forms of green investment banks. Will the new public option for worker pension funds truly wrest control from traditional Wall Street pension managers? Or would it be one form of disappointing, quote, 
uh, public, uh, 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 private um, partnership, unquote, where the private captures the public. What order of magnitude are we talking about and how do we get it through a divided Congress? Today, we're publishing her um, article describing her proposal. Tomorrow, we'll publish um, our four reactions and we'll offer a brief final response on Thursday. So all these responses, okay, are out there now. I'll be considering the reactions, okay, on Saturday and maybe her final response as well if I can fit it in. But realistically speaking, probably some of this will hang over till next Tuesday because I want to cover some other things okay, as well. And a lot of the reactions were fairly long, as are uh, the initial article from uh, from Omarova um, here. Her final response is not as long as the uh, the other articles, but it's all very illuminating anyway, and worth going through and okay, learning about. In the wake of the COVID crisis, we're facing a multifaceted challenge of rebuilding the American economy by addressing climate change, um, economic, and racial um, inequality, financialization, and uh, by privatization of uh, 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 productive assets, and other structural problems the crisis made impossible to ignore. Leaving this effort in the hands of private actors and markets is not an option. A massive shift toward a sustainable, inclusive, and dynamic 21st century economy requires tremendous commitment of public uh, resources, and just as importantly, public leadership and coordination. It's a fundamentally political undertaking, which involves making explicit distributional choices and using governmental powers to turn them into uh, the reality. Okay, to do it right, we need a well-designed institutional base, a federal entity with democratic accountability, broad uh, the legal authority, and in-house capacity to identify long-term um, um, economic development goals, translate them into specific investment uh, 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 priorities, and finance and actively implement these priorities in practice. We currently don't have such an institution. The last entity of this kind in the past hundred years of American history was the New Deal era's um, a Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the RFC, um, established in 1932. That is, it was established under Hoover. And remember, it was established in 1932. That was before Roosevelt took over in 1933. The RFC played the pivotal role in leading the country out of the depression as the federal government's principal financing arm. The RFC systematically supplied, um, uh, um, systematically supplied um, uh, the very massive amounts of credit and equity capital to banks, big and small businesses and public agencies at a time when private credit was scarce. Not surprisingly, the pandemic reignited interest in creating a modern version of the RFC. In a recent report, I have out what she links to here, by the way, I've outlined core features of a proposal to create a National Investment Authority, um, NIA, as precisely this kind of a public institution um, 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 adapted to today's um, situation. This essay describes the NIA's role as a powerful public actor working inside private markets and making them work for all of us. She sees the NIA as a federal um, entity created by Congress to fill the institutional gap between the Treasury, our fiscal authority, and the Federal Reserve, our central bank. It would be charged with devising, financing, and executing a long-term national strategy of economic development and reconstruction. The NIA would act directly in financial markets, actively allocating both public and private capital to where it's most needed in our fight against climate change, inequality, and other structural uh, ills. We can call it 
industrial or development policy a crucial supplement to the fiscal okay and uh the uh, the monetary policies of the united states the nia structure would be broadly similar to that of the federal reserve system at the top of the nia uh, ecosystem would be the governing board k of the nia an independent federal agency whose members are appointed by the president with congressional approval for sufficiently long terms and guaranteed a high degree of decision making uh, 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 autonomy. So if it's like the Fed, people would be appointed for six year terms. Okay. Um, in other words, the governors uh, would be appointed for six year terms. NIA board members would be selected based on their experience and expertise in finance, environmental science, engineering, urban planning, um, uh, 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 labor relations law, community organizing, and so forth. The breadth of representation on the NIA board is key as its principal role would be much broader than purely financial investment uh, um, 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 decisions. The NIA board would be charged with planning and coordinating the overall strategy of the country's transition to a clean and inclusive economy. It would identify and continuously update key national um, economic um, the priorities and formulate a public investment strategy in line with those um, priorities. The NIA board would operate specially chartered government-owned corporations, the National Infrastructure Bank, and the National Capital Management Corporation, also known okay, as Nikki Mac. Um, it would be initially financed through a one-time congressional appropriation. These um, NIA subsidiaries would be charged okay, with mobilizing and channeling public and private finance into large-scale critical public uh, um, um, infrastructure projects. These would include not only traditional physical infrastructure, but also cutting edge clean energy and manufacturing facilities, public transit and broadband systems, also affordable housing, job um, 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 retraining and public education, etc. Both NIB and um, 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 also, Nikki Mack would target investments in publicly beneficial projects that do not get funded at the necessary scale, either in private markets or through existing fiscal channels. While there's plenty of private capital eager to invest in hard assets like toll roads, private investors are rationally averse to funding inherently risky, transformative projects that take a long time to become a, a profitable in any commercial sense. Public investment, in turn, is perennially constrained as a result of dysfunctional budget politics and lack of internal coordination. The NIB, okay, and Nikki Mack would step into this funding gap in both credit and equity markets. The NIB would be the NIA's uh, 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 lender arm. So. Uh, it would focus on credit-based financing of large-scale public infrastructure through federal grants, loans, guarantees, insurance, um, securitization, and secondary market making. The NIB would purchase and pool uh, um, 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 and uh, uh, pool revenue bonds and project bonds um, um, issued by uh, um, um, issued issued by municipalities, public uh, utilities, and other government instrumentalities, as well as qualifying private sector bonds supporting uh, 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 publicly beneficial projects. The NIB would finance its operations by issuing its own bonds backed by their pooled assets 
and eligible for the Federal Reserve's purchases, much like Treasury and agency securities are today. So the NIB would issue debt, basically. Um, 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 going to Nicky Mac, it would be the NIA's venture capital and asset management um, arm. It would focus on equity-based finance, uh, which is more appropriate for truly transformative public and social infrastructure that bond investors consider too risky. I would uh, what, uh, what Nicky Mack would do is set up a series of investment funds and solicit pension funds, insurance companies, endowments, foreign sovereign wealth funds, and similar investors to purchase passive um, equity states, stakes, okay, essentially limited partner interests in its funds. Wall Street banks, private equity, and hedge funds would not be um, eligible participants. As the sole manager or general partner of uh, 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 Nicky Mac would control each fund's investment uh, uh, decisions. Its in-house professional teams would select and manage with appropriate public input and oversight individual funds portfolios of assets nationwide clean energy and uh, um, um, high speed uh, but, um, but, um, but, um, um, high speed rail networks um, but also regional and air and water cleaning and preservation programs state of the art community health facilities and so on by taking equity stakes in multiple operating companies, uh, 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 Nicky Max funds would be able to finance a wide range of innovative projects that can potentially leapfrog the U.S. economy in accordance with the NIA's national development strategy. Importantly, these projects need not all be commercially viable in the conventional market sense. Unlike private fund managers, um, uh, it won't be necessary uh, for, uh, for Nicky Mac to squeeze cash revenues out of its portfolio assets to repay fund investors. It's because, that's because its, its investments are driven not by short-term profits, but by public policy considerations. And two, if and when it's necessary, it can leverage its direct access to the federal government's financial resources. In other words, to the Federal Reserve and its capability to generate um, funds. Thus, uh, at Nicky Mac could guarantee return of the principal investment to those investing in funds um, by prioritizing commercially unprofitable projects like toll-free roads, adult education centers, or public parks. It would also offer equity-like equity -like additional returns that reflect the current estimates of long-term local, regional, or national macroeconomic impacts of these funds and projects. If, for example, experts calculate that a particular fund's investments would generate an additional 5% in regional or national economic growth of a certain period of time, uh, then uh, but uh, but uh, a Nicky Mac would translate that projected public gain into a corresponding added return for the investors in the fund. As to the actual sources of repayment, the expectation is that after an initial takeoff period, the NIA's total assets um, generating interest, of a dividend, and other revenues should be sufficient to cover its ongoing expenses. The larger and more diverse its project portfolio, the more flexibility the NIA will have in utilizing various streams of operating revenues to fulfill its current investor um, obligations. 
them. Um, in addition, the Federal Reserve's continuous uh, liquidity support would play the critical role in increasing the NIA's ability to finance what needs to be built rather than what generates short-term profits. By maintaining a liquid secondary market for NIB bonds and a dedicated borrowing line for Nicky Mack, the Federal Reserve would effectively free the NIA from the debilitating constraints of, quote, commercial viability. It would also give the NIA the flexibility to scale up its investments if and when that was necessary to sustain the momentum in the economy without being subject to the whims of a dysfunctional political process. Putting the Federal Reserve's balance sheet behind the NIA instruments would make them highly desirable, quote, unquote, safe assets for institutional investors. It is hard to overestimate potential systemic, that is, public um, benefits of this move. With carefully structured federal backup, the NIB bonds, and also Nikki Mac um, issuances, would be able to absorb large amounts of private capital that currently has no productive outlet. The NIA would divert substantial flows of money from short-term financial speculation and job-destroying private equity funds into job-creating, environmentally clean, and socially responsible economic um, um, activities. Uh, one could think of this as an effective, quote, public option for institutional investors. Introducing this option would significantly reduce the likelihood of speculation-induced financial crises. So this would have an economic stability function also. It would also blunt, if not eliminate, the underlying structural causes of excessive, quote, financialization, unquote, too much money, quote, trapped, unquote, inside the financial system, increasingly divorced from the real um, um, economy. So again, a financial stabilization function for this National Investment Authority arm. More fundamentally, the NIA would redefine the public-private balance in the economic sphere. By directly allocating capital to productive uses, it would undermine the currently unchallenged structural power of large Wall Street banks and pension fund managers over okay, our economic uh, 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 lives. Thus, without pension funds and other investors' money, private equity groups would not be able to continue accumulating control over entire industries, looting firms' assets, and laying off uh, their workers. In other words, this is going to put people like, uh, like Mitt Romney out of business. I wonder if this could get through the Congress. As a major lender, too, and especially as an active shareholder in multiple portfolio companies, the NIA would be able to to uh, set effective nationwide standards for wages and uh, worker representation, environmental safety, workplace diversity and equity, and so forth. This is where um, um, NIA's ability to invest in equity with full voting and management rights, including the new, quote, golden share, unquote, instrument I proposed elsewhere becomes an invaluable tool of real social change to magnify this effect, the NIA's role as the ready source of patient equity capital dedicated to public good could also encourage the emergence of new forms of, 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 of new forms of mutual and employee-owned firms and investment vehicles, thus democratizing ownership of financial assets. In short, the bigger and more assertive um, NIA would help to reverse the systemic damage wrought by the decades-long process of privatizing control over the nation's uh, uh, economic uh, resources. In this sense, 
the NIA is the exact opposite of the traditional quote public um, private uh, um, uh, partnership unquote uh, 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 model of infrastructure finance. Instead of placing public money under private managers' control, here the public institution controls how private investors' capital is deployed and how their contribution is uh, rewarded. This distinction is vital. The NIA model preserves the healthy core of the public-private partnership while removing its present dysfunctions. Tellingly, the NIA's target investor base is not greedy uh, Wall Street, quote unquote, seeking to privatize public infrastructure by partnering with pension funds, quote, green, unquote, and socially responsible funds and other mission-driven institutions. The NIA would strengthen these entities' abilities to pursue their important social objectives more successfully and independently. Stronger pension funds, for example, would mean more financially secure retirees and less strain on public resources. By facilitating this outcome, the NIA would be effectively, quote, subsidizing, unquote, all of us. From the NIA's perspective, partnering with outside investors offers a crucial benefit of shielding its operations from the vagaries of federal budget politics. With its own balance sheet and funding sources, the NIA need not be hostage to annual congressional infighting over the federal budget, and therefore would not be unnecessarily hamstrung in its activities. It would be free to pursue a bold economic agenda of the kind needed um, today. Of course, it makes especially important to ensure democratic accountability and transparency of the NIA's operations. The NIA's business model heightens the ever-present risk of capture by private interests and abuse by incumbent politicians. Uh, um, uh, so, accordingly, the NIA proposal contains specific governance, reporting, and audit mechanisms, including the creation of a permanent public interest council to keep a watchful eye on the NIA's activities. The NIA's regional offices spread across the country would also play a critical role in um, um, enabling continuous community input and democratic um, um, dialogue on the NIA's developmental priorities. The precise NIA design is a work in progress, but the main point here is simple. We cannot rely on traditional channels for public credit, both because our politics is dysfunctional and because the public needs more control over how resources are deployed on the ground. We need a public investment strategy that leads the entire financial market in the right uh, direction. We need to blend um, to we need to blend political pragmatism, financial sophistication, and passion for progress. That is what the NIA uh, would do. Now, to me, that seems like a very well-constructed proposal, uh, very comprehensive. In some ways, I would have a few immediate questions about it. If we also proceed in parallel with a public banking strategy of the kind that was outlined, uh, oh, that I covered, was it in of uh, Wednesday's live stream, I think the uh, the Ellen Brown uh, strategy of spawning public banks uh, 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 um, all over the country would be useful for them to be integrated with the NIA structure. Or would it would be better to have the public banks 
as a separate form of independent financial um, infrastructure, not as uh, centralized, okay, as the NIA uh, would um, likely be. Would it, in other words, further enforce uh, 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 innovation if we had a decentralized public bank structure that worked in parallel with uh, the NIA, or perhaps that structure could be a third arm, okay, of the NR, uh, the uh, the NIA, in addition to uh, the uh, the NIB, the National um, Infrastructure Bank, and uh, what was the other arm called? Ah, Nikki Mack. Uh, the National Capital Management uh, the Corporation. Of course, the public banks would primarily operate uh, through loans. So the financial tools that uh, the Nikki Mac would have would be more flexible. So this is uh, actually kind of interesting. Uh, the National Infrastructure Bank would be more centralized, like uh, the Federal Reserve is. Uh, in fact, uh, the network of public banks um, could belong both to the National Infrastructure Bank system and as well to the Federal Reserve system. That might be a very interesting combination. So that is my initial reaction to this particular proposal. Okay. A second reaction is, it seems to me it would be difficult to get this through Congress, primarily because many Republicans don't believe in centralized um, planning. This appears to have a considerable amount of centralized planning. It is, as the author says, industrial policy. Historically, the Republican Party has been the enemy okay, of industrial policy, uh, actually given to go crazy even when the term industrial policy okay, is mentioned, as it was for a while during the early part okay, of the 1980s until the Republicans went uh, totally apeshit over the term and all discussion of industrial policy was basically banished from D.C. It's nice to see it coming back now in this particular form. But, uh, uh, and this is certainly a design which is very interesting, and it is extremely New Dealish, extremely appropriate, okay, for the Green New Deal. But I suspect to get this legislation through Congress that we might have to wait Till Democrats have control of both the House with a more appreciable margin than they have now, okay, and also the Senate. And by the way, the latest on the House, as it looks like the final numbers in the House, may well be 222 to 213. That's small. Only that's only a majority of five votes if 218 okay would be a majority so if you got five votes taken away you'd have only 217 and the other side then could have a majority in opposition to what uh, you know say the democrats wanted to do this is significant Okay, for another reason, which we can get to okay, in a little while. But for now, I find myself, having completed the articles that I wanted to cover for tonight, I did have a fourth article, just in case I had some extra time. Uh, that article was uh, actually the first of the reactions to the NIA proposal, I had that 
possibly scheduled for today, but that article is too long. And I, I would be running over time if I tried to handle it now. So I'm going to wait until Saturday to get to that. And I'm going to turn to you. Uh, in order to see what you think of what I've had to say tonight and any other subjects that you might have uh, uh, in mind. So let me. Stop sharing this and get back to you. How's that? And by the way, since I'm getting back to you, let me remind you again that, okay, I do have a Patreon account. Okay, and like everybody else, in this business Um, I am also in need of support so if you could uh, um, please visit my Patreon account from time to time Um, um, there is the link and you also are looking at it whenever I'm on screen. So please go there occasionally uh, and throw in a bit of support. I would uh, certainly appreciate it. Okay, let me get back to the beginning here. And Kay says, he's a loser for sure. You mean Rom? Rom is a is a loser. Hey, Sandy Degg, how are you? Kay says, hey, Sandy Evelina says, very bad on you, Emmanuel. And Evelina says, scratch second them. Very bad on Emmanuel. Yes, he's very bad. As soon as I saw him in Obama's cabinet, I knew Obama was a corporate dem. At the time when I first saw him okay, in Obama's cabinet, I still wasn't entirely sure because even if Obama uh, was attempting to do something to get us out of corporatism okay, and neoliberalism, he would have needed someone with Rom's skills uh, in in dealing with uh, the Congress, okay, because um, Obama certainly didn't have those skills himself. He needed someone with very good contacts in the Congress, which Rahm had at that time. So I wasn't sure until I saw how Rahm acted. Then I knew that it was all curtains. That's when I started getting very obstreperous when it came to Obama. That, I believe, was early in February of 2009. Didn't take me too long to adjust to what Obama uh, was really about. Sandy said, hi, Kay. Sandy said, shared. Thank you, Sandy. Arvel said, I don't know if Arvel's phone caught a virus or what, but the stream is constantly spinning and cutting off. There could be an issue with uh, the Wi-Fi. I'm still cabled up to Uh, the internet. So I don't think I have an issue on my side. Sandy said, Obama's going to run the country. I've seen more speeches by Obama than I do of Joe. Joe B will be history in less than a year. Could be. Kay says, I hate that they did that. Nursing homes should never be corporate owned. Yes. But of course, Gina Raimondo was a venture capitalist. So she probably had some interest in those nursing homes herself, maybe. Kay said, low-income apartments should never be corporate-owned or run either. The one I had to live in was filthy. Well, there were, of course, many filthy low-income homes that were publicly owned as well. Uh, One of the arguments for turning some public apartment um, 
of, of developments over to the private sector was that though the private sector would have an interest in them, have a property interest, they would better take care of the properties. Of course, this kind of argument uh, really neglected to notice all the slumlords to allow their properties in urban areas, you know, to deteriorate um, all the time. But Anyway, that was a silly argument. All I want to say is both um, the corporate owned um, 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 low income apartments and publicly owned low income apartments uh, can be very badly run. And whether they are or not depends on the budgetary uh, 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 allocations. In the public sector, it probably largely depends on whether state and local governments are adequately funded, either by taxes or by federal aid. Of course, the public sector has been starved, uh, actually, from before the time that Reagan took over, but certainly since Reagan's time, the public sector has been starved funds for maintenance okay and for development i mean we're looking at 40 years of uh, you know, neglect now that's why our infrastructure program is uh, so necessary and the state of our infrastructure is so poor compared to that in many other countries now it says so far i'm only having trouble with the live stream videos work good okay that's terrific i'll have some more videos i just need some time to post them. I have a number of others I've already cut this week. Sandy says, I'm talking about the progressive short takes now. Sandy says, what is wrong with these people? They must get off on hurting or killing people. It's sick. Yeah, they must get off. I, I agree. They must get off on hurting or killing people. It's, you know, it's beyond me. It's just people should not be appointed um, you know, to um, public positions who don't want to work for the public purpose. That's all there is to it. But what's beyond me, really, is how people can vote um, for the people they vote for. I'm still very angry at the results of the election when it came to the Senate. And I wonder, how could people who voted to keep most of the Republicans in who were in danger, how could they fail to notice that if they did that, the chances of getting a big stimulus bill that would help them, that would help them, would be far less? How could they go into the election thinking that if they voted for a Republican, they would be better off than if, if they replaced Senator McConnell as the majority leader by voting their Republican senator out. I mean, the Republicans' clocks should have been cleaned in the Senate election. In many of the states, they had small margins, but they were still able to hang in there because people didn't understand they were voting against themselves. So many people were voting against themselves. If the public opinion polls before the election had shown the Republicans were up for a total landslide, totally getting thrown out in 13 or 14 states, from the standpoint of getting a stimulus bill prior to the election, that scenario would have been the best one. But that wasn't what people were seeing prior to the election. They didn't see really a landslide cave in favor of the Democrats. Some people said that there might be one. There might be one. The potential was there. But they also thought all the races were tight. None of those races should have been tight. 
if they had not been tight, the Republicans would have panicked and they would have done anything Pelosi wanted. Of course, Pelosi didn't run a campaign for her, her um, um, HEROES Act. She passed the bill in May. And then she did nothing to call attention to that bill. She did not remind people that there were stimulus checks in that bill. She didn't structure it so there would be repeated stimulus checks. Instead, she put in $500 billion to shore up the lobbyists in Washington. I'm talking about her $3.4 trillion bill that she passed the, through the House okay, on May 23rd. She should have campaigned on that all summer long and built up the pressure against Mitch McConnell and those Republican senators all summer long. And of course, she should have restructured that bill so it didn't have the lobbyist money, but instead had another two rounds of stimulus checks. That would have brought people to the polls to throw those Republicans out, for sure. Kay said, um, but my friend who worked in that apartment building is gone now. I think she must be sick or dead from the virus. Could be. That's terrible. Steve Gonzo said, there are lines and lines of iPad stations that are being prepared for virtual ICU um, end of life uh, visits. Soon we'll be going to virtual mass uh, 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 funerals. Yeah, latest I've been hearing is that uh, some of the modeling people okay, are projecting 400,000 deaths due to COVID in the United States by the end of uh, February. So they're expecting uh, roughly um, 60,000 a month in fatalities. Let's take a look at uh, current figures. Okay, let me get the now figure. for you from the Worldometer site. Twenty nine hundred and eighteen fatalities today. That is, I believe, a new record. That was enough to take us over the 280,000 mark. We're now at 282,829 fatalities. We're now at 852 per million fatalities. And that means that Well, there are other nations that have been moving very fast as well. So we're now number nine, re, uh, not counting uh, the countries with populations that uh, 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 that are pocket-sized. Uh, one country that's ahead of us is Bosnia and uh, Herzegovina. They're at 859 deaths per million. Argentina, which is up to 866. But I think now we're closing in okay, in Argentina. We're moving faster than Argentina now. And the UK is at 800 okay, and 84. They're still moving very fast, but not as fast okay, as we are. Uh, but we're still 32 deaths per million behind the UK, 
um, but North Macedonia is at 887. So those are the nations that are somewhat close to us. Things are going badly for Mexico also. They're at 831 per million. France has now gone up to 829 per million. Brazil is at 822 per million. A lot of countries are moving very fast now. Very, very fast. There are a lot of countries over 800 deaths per million, including the uh, Czech Republic. If you recall, for many, many months, okay, the Czech Republic was doing extremely well. Just looking at the end of this again to see if things are still... Uh, where they were for the most part. Uh, there's Taiwan still at three tenths of a fatality per million. With Vietnam, four tenths of a fatality per million. Thailand, nine tenths of a fatality per million. So compared to Twat, to uh, Taiwan, our performance is now, what, 2,600 times worse than, uh, than Taiwan. It's awful. Just awful. So going back to your comments... Sandy says, um, horrible. Okay, says, my Ohio County is now purple for the first time. Uh, um, bad as it gets for the virus. Shake my head. Evelina says, uh, Raimondo is a bad choice. He was at all of Biden's picks from a diversity point of view. But they aren't about a diversity at all. Uh, yeah, the diversity is an excuse not to appoint people who are progressive, while appointing people who are neoliberal. Any time they get near a progressive appointee, they seem to try to, to, uh, to find a diversity reason why someone else would also fulfill the diversity criteria. They don't succeed entirely about that. Susan Eldridge is here. Hiya, Susan. She says, listening while I'm working. Kay says, I like this idea. I have to remember that um, and I being uh, 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 name, I think, isn't it? The National Infrastructure Bank, right? Okay, says, I bought my first home under the old FHA when it actually helped um, low-income people get a start in life. Now I see they put that um, neighborhood downwind of an Ashland um, oil refinery. Okay, says, couldn't breathe some days and the cars were sometimes covered gay and ash. Those old houses are now going for over a hundred thousand. Laugh out loud, um, to go figure. A hundred thousand is a uh, it's a very low price these days for a house. These guns it says keep a close look at the night sky this month and you may see a rare occurrence between the two biggest planets in our solar system. Jupiter and Saturn. And Kay says, Romney needs to be out of business and out of government, too. Yes, he does. He does, but I don't think um, in Utah that he will ever be out of the Senate. He probably has that Senate chair for life. His family is too prominent um, in Mormon circles okay, in Utah. Kay says, Steve Gonzo, I actually think deaths in Ohio have been um, underreported, says Kay, to Steve Gonzo. I scrolled down too fast, folks. i got to find where I was. Yeah. Kay says, hope, um, hope my roommate gets a vaccine soon. 
as he works in an assisted living place here. Well, then he might, he should be able to get one among the uh, first people to get it, I would think. Even before we can get one, I think we're in the second group, the, the over 80 group. Bonnie has joined us now. And Kay says, we need to teach real civics in high school. My kids learned from me. My school years didn't teach us all we needed to know, but at least we learned the basics. They don't teach any of it now from what I have learned. Kay says they had the wrong candidate in Kentucky, thanks to Schumer. Yeah, they did. With a little bit of money, Charles Booker would have been the candidate, and Booker probably would have beaten the Mitch. Certainly, he wouldn't have lost by 20 points. That's for sure. Harold says, Nancy was too busy wearing uh, kente cloths and practicing vacuous kneeling gestures over the summer. Oh, she's so screwed up. The first of the negotiations for the CARES Act. She had Mitch over a barrel then. His donors wanted that $4.6 trillion money can to be established. She could have told him no. No, you don't get that until my people are taken care of. Well, the problem is she doesn't consider the people to be her people, which that's what disqualifies her to be the speaker for the Democratic Party. She is not our speaker. She's the speaker of the suburban creatives. Unfortunately for her, they're only about 9% of the population. Steve says, considering less than 10% have been tested, um, um, I'll take the OVER. Steve Gonzo said that. Kay says, by the way, where is Steve Wolfbrand today? Kay says, Steve, people alone die in their homes, apartments, and they are not tested usually. Um, the no autopsy, Steve Gonzo says, if they had other conditions like heart strike, etc., which the virus is very bad on, it is marked as the underlying condition. Novel says, COVID winter 2020, surely the Grim Reaper is tired now. The Grim Reaper never gets tired, unfortunately. Alva says, we'd have to steal Romney's magic long johns to get rid of him. His magic long johns. That's funny. Magic long johns for Romney. Steve Gonzo says, anti-vaxxers have doubled since March. They have for now. But uh, once they see that the vaccine is successful, and people are walking around without any masks uh, and feeling comfortable and very few getting sick. Uh, it will probably result in a lot of them changing their minds. These vaccines are reportedly, based on the testing, unusually effective the vaccines. Uh, they may be a little painful to take at first, but they will be effective in 95% of the people, apparently. That's fantastic. That's going to create the herd immunity that Trump always wanted. Too bad he couldn't have gone like this and had a vaccine after a week. That would have been his ideal world. Unfortunately, his dream the world ideal is world does not exist. Mm -hmm. That's his dream world. A spoiled child can't always have what he wants, what he needs. Any other comments yeah. or questions? Any comments or questions about this, what looks like a very good proposal from uh, by Professor, uh, by, um, by, um, by Professor Omarova. K 
Kay says, another reason I want my roommate to get his first. See how he does with it. <laughs> well, he'll probably be among the 95%. The odds are he'll be among okay, the 95%. And I don't think the remaining 5% get sick or anything like that. They just don't have uh, the antibodies. Maybe more than a couple of hours. Really? Yeah, it might be a day or so with this. And people might get fever with it also mm -hmm. at the start. So it looks like people are going to be sick a little with this vaccine after the first shot. Yeah, sure after the second it. shot, it should be a lot easier. Make sure you have a thermometer. Yeah. I'm talking about the Pfizer vaccine, of course. I think after you take the first vaccine, that you should go home, basically, and ride it out. Okay, says, I like the NIB idea as long as it doesn't get um, corrupted like the FHA did. Well, whether it gets corrupted or not isn't a function of the proposal. It's a function of the kind of people we elect um, for office. Uh, once we get out of this fix, I hope it is a very, very long time until people decide to vote for the Republicans again, if ever. I mean, I think the Democrats, okay, are bad enough, but we really need for the Republican Party to be destroyed so the Democratic Party can safely split, okay, into a progressive party, okay, and a party which is more respectful of the donors. Unfortunately, probably never get rid of the donors, that we could get rid of the financial corruption. That we could probably do by passing uh, new campaign finance laws and using Article 3, Section 2 to prevent the Supreme Court from, uh, from ruling on them. Okay, at least until uh, we get uh, the courts packed in the proper way again. Kay says the People's Party are on the ballot now in Maine. Yes, I've gotten emails to that effect. Steve Gonzo says we're the most optimistic pessimists I know. Maybe that's good, Steve. Optimistic pessimists. And Kay says, true, Steve. Okay. So here's my program for the next couple of days. I'll be posting some more progressive short takes uh, tomorrow, probably two tomorrow and at least one on Saturday. And I'll have my usual Saturday show at 9 p.m. on Saturday night. So those are my plans. Uh, of course, we'll be keeping up with the latest in terms of what's going on with the administration. Uh, on Saturday, I plan to take account of the reactions to the Omarova plan. I'm sure you'll be very interested in those. Uh, I may not be able to get through them all on Saturday, in which case that's probably going to hang over till Tuesday especially because I'll be considering other news since new significant things are happening um, every day. Uh, one more thing, in case I thank you, Joe and all, for another great uh, discussion. 
Um, I love you all. We love you too, Kay. There are stories that surface that have just surfaced regarding Heather Boucher, if that's the way she pronounces her name, as opposed to Bushy. But anyway, uh, she, of course, was one of the two progressive picks for the Council okay, of Economic Advisors. And stories are circulating about her being a very, very poor manager uh, who's been guilty of basically verbally abusing uh, employees at places that she previously worked. And some credible people um, have been publicly complaining about okay, her elevation to the council okay, of economic advisors. Now, whether what we're seeing are smears, uh, like the client we got, okay, with Shahed Buttar, or whether we're seeing something real, um, I don't know. But undoubtedly, over the next few days, this is going to be vetted. And it may present a problem of confirmation uh, for Biden. Also, near a tandem is getting vetted very, very seriously for the negative aspects of um, her personality. And I don't know whether Biden can get her through. There's been a lot of speculation that she's sort of a sacrificial uh, um, 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 you know, kind of a sacrificial goat or lamb of, you know, of Biden's that he nominated her actually to appease uh, the, uh, the donors, uh, you know, because they really like her. So he wanted to try to get her in, but that um, he knew right along that he wouldn't be able to get her in because the Republicans um, hate her. And the progressives hate her too. And also because her confirmation is going to require Bernie Sanders to support her. And she was the most aggressive of anybody attacking Bernie Sanders, you know, for Medicare for all and for socialism and being very anti-Bernie and lying about him and smearing him. And you remember all, all the bad stuff from her um, concerning Bernie. Now she needs the support okay, of Bernie because He's either going to be the ranking member of the budget committee again, or he's going to be the chairperson of okay, the budget committee again, uh, depending on what happens okay, on January 5th. Okay, by the way, if those Georgians do not vote for the two Democrats, okay, and if those same Georgians are expecting um, any more stimulus checks, then they would be being completely stupid because they're not getting any more stimulus checks if they vote those two crooked Republicans back in. Their only chance for stimulus checks then okay, is if they vote the two Democrats in, then at least Biden would have a chance to pass some version of a bill that would provide relief okay, for uh, uh, individuals. Kay says, I hope that Bernie stands up on that. Yeah, I hope he stands up on it too. Okay, so Dolores says, thank you, Kay, and good night. And Kay says she hopes okay, that Bernie stands up on that. Yeah, so do I. I hope he stands up too. And he says, look, she's not acceptable to me. I'm not going to back her. And I'm going to vote against her. I think he's got to tell Biden that. He's got to say, hey, Joe, we worked with you. We were expecting a more progressive uh, uh, group of people in your cabinet. Instead, what we're getting from you is a bunch of obnoxious neoliberals, not even courteous, rude uh, neoliberals. 
that you keep going back to. We're not standing for that. I'm not confirming that. And other senators on the Democratic side are also going to vote with me. And what he should do is talk to Jeff Merkley and also Kristen Gillibrand, maybe, and Ron Wyden. See if he can get three or four of them to break ranks and to vote against uh, Mira Tandon. It's very important that they do vote against her. Susan says, what economic or academic qualifications does Tandon have to be the OMB head? She has none. She is ill-qualified for that job. And there's not a person who has said that she has, has the qualifications to handle that particular job well. All they do is say that she's a very bright person. That's supposed to be her qualification. But she has no previous experience uh, that gives her a qualification to be the budgetary head, to actually structure a budget and have it make sense. Susan says, Bernie will support Tandon, get ready for it. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm expecting him to because he has folded this whole freaking campaign. But Biden has now been elected. I don't expect him to fold anymore. I don't expect him to fold anymore. I expect him to defend us. In fact... I think the confirmation of Tandon should be Bernie's signal to move the hell over to the People's Party. Well, let's put it this way. If there's a scenario, the first thing Bernie should do is vote against Tandon and personally defeat her in order to send a signal to Biden, basically saying, I'm not taking any more shit from you. You better start behaving, or otherwise, I'm going to do what I can to derail your neoliberal program and see what Biden does. If then Biden uses his influence okay, to deprive Bernie of his chairmanship, then I think that should be the signal for Bernie to defect to the People's Party. He can do that, still keep his Senate seat. They cannot throw him out of the Senate. He still keeps his uh, seniority. He's got to get something because they always give in to the seniority system. It's too important to them. So that's what I, w uh, that's what I would do if I were Bernie anyway. Honestly, if I were in Bernie's shoes... I would be on the phone to Biden this instance, and I would say, you withdraw Tandon. If you don't want to see your pick publicly rejected by the Senate, you withdraw Tandon now. And Ron, don't let me hear any more rumors with respect to Ron. Ron and Tandon are persona non grata as far as our progressives are concerned. You're not getting them, even if we have to vote with the Republicans to stop it. Bernie's got to get on the phone to him, and he's got to tell him. He should have done it already. If you want to be publicly repudiated, keep on pushing it, Joe. Otherwise, get them out of here. And I don't want to hear about Gina Raimondo either. Steve says, uh, Roger Stone says, South Korea shipped um, the ballots uh, through Main Harbor. Ah, oh, Roger Stone's a fucking liar. How can you believe anything Roger Stone says? He's just a fucking liar trying to make trouble. He never did anything in his life except to make trouble and try to divide people and do racist things. I mean, Roger Stone is the most horrible person. I mean, if there's anybody in the political system worse than Donald Trump, it's got to be Roger Stone and, of course, the fascists at Charlottesville. Susan Eldridge says people are focusing on our horrible behavior. 
but no one has talked about her complete lack of qualifications. That's the way it goes in D.C., disgusting. Yeah, you're right, Susan. Very few have talked about her lack of qualifications. But David Sirota talked about it. He talked about the fact that she was totally unqualified for that job. I think Biden's playing a very interesting game, okay, with his cabinet. He puts up um, the people, waits for protests and anger and rage. And then when he gets that, he puts them up for other positions which are not so visible. And he keeps on doing it. But um, every time they're whacked, they pop up in some other position. He's playing a whack-a-mole game with us. That's what he is. I think we need to whack him upside the head. He's the one who needs to be whacked. Steve Gonzo said, says balance, ops, laugh out loud. Susan Eldridge says, Tandon is the female equivalent of Trump, only she's on the Democratic, um, the liberal side, so it's okay. I think she's the female equivalent of Roger Stone. Because we have to admit she's smarter than Trump. Susan says, I feel very ambivalent about Bernie. Me too. I feel very ambivalent about him too. We need to grow new leaders. I mean, we've got some. We're growing. AOC, Rashida, Pramila, um, but, um, but, um, but, um, Rokana, um, Ilhan. Yeah, we got some, some pretty good ones, but we don't have anybody Need more than uh, with the stature right now, with the name recognition that Bernie Sanders has. Uh, we need Nina. Yeah. We need Nina Turner. Hello, somebody. <laughs> uh, the far right has embraced um, um, an election conspiracy theory. So absurd, the army came out and denounced it. The members of the 305th Military Intelligence Battalion are not, quote, the Kraken, unquote, that an attorney for President Donald Trump said, yeah, Sidney Powell, quote, Trump attorney Harkins is referring to as Sidney Powell, yeah, the nutcase, who promised to release the Kraken, quote, unquote, with her lawsuits challenging Biden's victory. Yeah, all she released was a big mess. In fact, I'm afraid that she and Giuliani released uh, the coronavirus on to Jen Dice, who caught uh, 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 COVID-19 because she attended that nutty press conference in a very small room, in a very small room uh, at, um, I guess it was at RNC headquarters. They packed people into a very small room. And Jen Dice got um, but COVID-19, she's still flat on her back. As far as I know, that's, that was terrible. I, haven't seen her kids I mean, that's years. awful. Susan Eldridge said Roger Stone and gave some icons I cannot read in this interface. Kay says, Ohio needs Nina back in office. Not back in Ohio office. We need Nina in national office. She's too great. We need her at least in Congress. We need her in the Senate. We need her running for president. Anyway, I'm going to say good night now again. And I'll see you Saturday night, and you'll have some videos tomorrow. 
Have a great night. Thanks for coming.